So the first Jews could really come to Ashland um, in the years after the Civil War. They're coming from, from the German states, um, and they really are kind of the merchant class. They're owning the kind of retail stores in town. And in 1896, they established the city's first Jewish congregation, a Gudasachim. So in the early years of the congregation, they didn't have a building of their own. They would meet in rented spaces, um, often above retail stores downtown. In the early 20th century, there was a new wave of immigrants coming into Ashland, and they're coming from Eastern Europe. They tend to be more orthodox and traditional. And so this leads to a dispute within the congregation. Um, and in 1921, a Gudith Aachen becomes reformed, and a group of the Orthodox uh, Jews leave and establish their own congregation, House of Israel. There was sort of a divide between the members. And part of that, I think, emanated from the fact that a Gudith Aachen was originally an Orthodox congregation. So Gudith Aachen, um, um, kind of develops over the years. In 1925, they buy land for a cemetery, and in 1938, they actually dedicate their first permanent house of worship. It was a very loving but small group. When I was in Sunday school, maybe there, we started with, I can't remember, 15, 20 kids. And by the time we left, there were five. Sunday school, the religious school, we would do something for all the holidays and sing songs. We would build a sukkah, you know, in the temple. For Passover, we would have an annual Passover Seder. We were truly reform. Part of it is, is that um, my grandfather's generation really wanted to be assimilated um, into the local community. Um, I remember observing all the holidays. People really respected, um, I think our family, we were closed on the high holidays, our business was. Um, you know, we um, attended Friday night services once a month when the rabbi would come. I had bar mitzvah. I wouldn't say that our family was really religious, we had a very distinct Jewish identity, though. In my growing up years, we didn't have every Friday night. It started tapering off to maybe every other and then once a month. Whenever there were services, it was a command performance. Everybody went. Like, it didn't matter if you, you know, it was a homecoming game or the Friday night football game. You sh showed up because it was your commitment as part of the Jewish community to support the rabbi. Typically, people would come in and they would sit in their same areas or seats that they normally sat. We would normally sit in the middle of the right-hand side. My grandparents would sit with us, and my grandparents had friends, the Landau's, who were really like family to us. They would sit near us, and then Minna Poland, who was another close friend of my um, parents and grandparents, so we would always kind of sit on that side. And then there were the Wiles, and the um, Freedmans, the Wolves, and they would sit back toward, and the Michelsons, and they would kind of sit back to the left, and the Geringers would sit on the right-hand side, kind of back behind us. So everybody kind of did have their own spot. But there are so many songs that, if I hear like, he name I and I'm, or Ankel, <laughs> like some of those old traditional songs, I can just, picture our temple and the specific people sitting in it and the voices, certain people whose voices were better than others, like you could still kind of hear them echoing in your mind. So I have a lot of memories of those services and the people there. Well, I went to Sunday school and my Sunday school teachers were Big Erringer and Sharon Simons. And I had a core group of friends who were there with me, uh, Bobby Corus and Nancy Neiman from Ironton, Mickey Weil from Ironton. I remember in the Sunday school that we talked a lot about real life problems because we did study the Torah as children. And, um, and by the time I remember going to the really Sunday school, like in middle school and part of high school, we would discuss real life problems and things that were happening to us in our lives and and we had some great down-to-earth teachers 
with Sharon and B, and it was really fun to go to Sunday school. She was there every every Sunday. I kind of felt like she was a little strict, you know, when I, I look back in my head, in that, you know, it wasn't nonsense. Like we would like, particularly, the, you know, like the chorus boys, people would like try to push back on her, make it nonsense. But she held pretty firm that it wasn't nonsense. She was a huge hearted person and also a real progressive, politically progressive person. Pope had converted to Judaism. She was a non-Jew who married Bernie and converted to Judaism and was very much an integral part of the community. And it was an interesting of her dedication to religious school education. She played piano by ear, she played all the Jewish songs, she sang. I don't remember her teaching me particularly. I think I remember B more in the teaching environment, but I remember her just being a good steward of the temple and the library. And, you know, there was a sisterhood there that my grandmother and my mother and B and Evelyn Weil and this Rowena Shradsky, there was a whole group of women that participated in the sisterhood and, you know, put on the satyrs and, you know, did various dinners, which Hope was always part of as well. So I would say there was a working group, you know, when I was growing up, maybe of 15 women. There was a very close clique of Jewish women, and many had come from more sophisticated backgrounds. When they came here, they kind of, you know, came together. And they were not religious people, my grandparents, nor my grandmother. They were not rela raised um, in an orthodox fashion or really even, you know, maybe they were, but they never, they didn't embrace it. When they came here, they really embraced the community of people that were part of this reform movement. Most of my grandparents' friends were Jewish, um, even though they did have some friends that weren't, where my parents kind of started to branch out and had other relationships outside of the Jewish community. Part of that was because there was already this, um, you know, trend of people leaving Ashland, going off to college, and not coming back. I was confirmed here in the synagogue in Ashland when I was 16. That was 40 years ago. My siblings were confirmed in Huntington just a couple years later. And they ultimately closed their building in 1986. They sold it in the year following. Um, and about 10 years later, they formally uh, disbanded the congregation.